G'day, I'm Steve. This is Woodworking Masterclass. Welcome to the workshop. Just to recap how far we've gone and what we've got to do this episode. After me saying to you, you've got to be careful when you lay it out because you can make a mistake. Guess what? I made the mistake. Uh, although I continued to carve it. Well, there's a closer close up of it. And as you can tell, the gap from here to here is larger than the gap from here to here. Although, a couple of lessons have been learnt. Firstly, and normally, most of you that have watched me know I never cut to final size until I finish doing what I'm doing, just in case of a mistake. Now, had I done that with this piece of rail, I could have had an extra inch on this end and an extra inch on this end, then I could have just chopped a bit off there, chopped a bit off there, and centralised the design. However, that wasn't the case and I persevered and I thought what I could do, I'm not going to do it, but what I could do if I wanted to cheat was cut the tenon a bit further in and then the tenons on all the other shelves for the plate rack, I could extend on one side and that way it would shorten the plate rack by about 19 mil or three quarters of an inch and this rail would fit. But I thought, nope, that's cheating. And if you have the same problem, you'll know how to get out of it. But I thought, all right, I'll set another one up and I'll make this one from scratch. And I've also found a much easier way to draw it up. So it's been a great learning curve for me and I hope you learned something from it as well. Okay, so I'll show you an easier way. If you decide that's the design you want to go with, with the four little petals in the circle. An easier way to draw it up is that's the thickness of the rail I'm using. I'm coming in five mil on each end and then I've drawn a centre line. I'm using the same compass setting as before. Now a little trick with compasses, if you're using a compass don't use a point use, I don't know if you can see there, it's a, like a wedge down here. You can either get a piece of sandpaper and just rub it like so and that will give you that wedge or a small file or something like that because then you've got a much sharper drawing edge on the side and again I've changed this to an HB so hopefully it won't flatten so much. So I've drawn one circle here already now you just position, and this is much easier, the lead on the edge of the circle you've just drawn, put the point on the centre line, and draw. Now continue that down the page. Where the circles actually touch, that's where you want to have your centre point the other semicircles you have to draw. Put your point on the, just draw it through. Then you've got something that looks like that with these lines coming up. And these parts here where it intersects is where you place your compass, right on that point there. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, that is a far easier way than the way I showed you before. However, the way I showed you before is good because you can look at the different design options you can make. But we'll stick with this one. It's easier. So I've got another piece of uh, Queensland walnut that I'm going to 
make another rail. Only this time what I'm going to do differently, I'm going to start in the centre with a circle and then I'm going to do a circle either side because I think the reason that this one is out is compounding error, which I spoke about earlier. So if I go one either side, I reckon we should be right. That's where I'm going to draw my first circle. And what I'll continue to do is that. So I'll go one on this side. And one on this side. And there we have all the circles drawn. Next what I'll do is where the circles meet, I'll use a square and I'll just bring those lines up. Remembering to put the point of your pencil on the point and then move your square up to it. Same thing, grab your compass and draw those half circles in. And again, going from side to side. In fact, with this one, I'd go side to side and top and bottom. That way the lead is going to blunt in at the same rate and when you sharpen it, you're going to fix up the compound of error. And there I have them all drawn up and ready to start cutting out. Another thing to really have uh, that's handy is a tube of super glue because this timber especially does break out. So if I'm trying to just cut around a leaf or a section like that and it lifts up, it's just a question of levering it up, putting a little bit of super glue in, getting a bit of masking tape, putting it down, and then by the time I'm ready to come back, it's glued. And I use a knife just in case I've got a little cranky bit and it won't come out. Now it's a question of finding a radius um, that best suits the circle you're using. In my case, as I said, I could get away with a 5.8, but this is a 5.12 and it'll do a good job on the inside. And the 5.8 does a good job for scooping out the middle. So here goes. What I'm going to do is the same angle all the way through. So I'm doing this quadrant here. And I'll put it right on the line. And instead of doing the whole scoop of the carving chisel in one go, I actually work it around. So I'm using about half the scoop and then I slide it and gradually bring it in a bit. And if I get a double cut anywhere, it looks unsightly at the moment, but we're going to clean the waste out and we'll get rid of that. If you're wondering why I've got masking tape, around my mallets. The only reason is they're really old mallets and the timber underneath all split and splintered and dented and it's just a way of holding it together. There's no other reason. It's not for cushioning or anything like that. It's, I like these mallets and I don't want to make a new one. I like this design as well because if you don't get it perfectly, it doesn't matter. It's meant to be quite a naive design. It actually, it's a gothic design and it doesn't have to be perfect. And in fact, it looks um, a lot more authentic if it's got a couple of lines that aren't quite straight. It's a very forgiving design in that regard. So now I've done all that line, if I turn it around, I can then do the other half, which is diagonally opposite, but my hands and everything are at the same angle and it's exactly the same cut. See that? It's a little like S's. So now we've got to take a different approach to the cutting and whatever suits you, whatever's more comfortable. I quite like the way it's turning out and it definitely got that handmade, not precision machine made quality to it.
Now all the circles are done. Now we start on the inside and just chop out the inside shapes. And here if you're a little bit out this is where you can actually make it up and fix any little uh, mistakes or little gaps or if it's not quite right you can fix it up with the chisel. Once again, turn it over, same deal, and then do the other four. And there you have it. I had a bit jump out there, but I had to put a little bit of super glue on, but it'll be dry when I come down to it. That's finished with the 512. I'm now going to use a 58. I could use the 512, but it gets a little bit cramped. So all I've got to do is scoop out these sections here. And then when I've scooped all of them out, then I'm going to scoop these diamond sections out. You do have a choice. If you want, you can scoop these little lozenge shape pieces out, which then will have this part here and the diamond sitting proud. I'm doing it the other way because I want these little lozenge shapes sitting up in relief, and then I'm going to take away the background and just undercut to the depth of those cuts that I've already put in. Don't necessarily come in for a big cut. But you don't want to go too deep because the deeper you go, the more risky run of having an error. Now here's one that I super glued down a couple of minutes ago. And as you can tell, it's behaving itself. See what I mean if you made a bit of a mess when you're cutting these shapes and you've come into the waist side. Like here, I don't know if you can see that, but I've got another cut line there. I'm just going to take that right out now. It really is a, a beautiful design and lovely in its simplicity, I think. That's how it's looking at the moment. Then I'll put a groove with, this is a 7.6. It's a slightly more curved tool than the fives. And I'm just gonna put a line down here to give it a little bit of definition. Then I'm gonna clean all these center pieces out here. finished it and there it is and it's centered which I'm wrapped about ah, that took about three hours my back is absolutely killing me so what I'm going to do is pull the shed door down but in episode six what we'll be doing is cutting the blind tenons on this the mortises in the sides rounding over the entire uh, I forgot what I'm making now it's out late the entire plate rack with a spoke shave, possibly put a cabinet scraper over it, put it all together, we'll put the wedges, wedges in, 
and I'll put a finish. I haven't decided what I'm going to do yet. I might stain it or I'll just put an oil finish on it or maybe shellac. Who knows? So this is Steve pulling the shed door down and saying remember to keep it sharp. But more importantly, keep it safe. Enjoy your woodwork. And if you like what we do, please like us on Facebook. If you'd like to know more or to be kept in the loop with a newsletter of what's happening, join up the e-workshop at woodworkingmasterclass.com.au. And if you'd like to become a supporter of Woodworking Masterclass through Patreon, you can check out the Patreon tab again at woodworkingmasterclass.com.au. And we've got some great rewards for those who decide to support us. So that's it. See you next episode. Be safe. Catch you later. Bye for now. Oh, that was a big day, Huey. Boy, that was a big day. Oh.